Hello, good afternoon. So, um, welcome to this event, um, to a poetry reading and discussion with Major Jackson um, under the title of Urban Renewal. So apart from its own worth as a wonderful event, it's also related to Radcliffe's urbanism theme for this entire academic year, uh, which we've explored in all kinds of ways. One was a big public lecture by Garth Risk Hallberg, who wrote City on Fire, a debut novel about New York in the 1970s. And we have a very large uh, public conference that's been a long time in the planning coming up on April 28th. It's called Intersections, Understanding Urbanism in the Global Age. And it's three panels and a um, keynote speaker, and it, it should be very lively and interesting. But uh, on to the matter at hand, I'm especially pleased to welcome Major Jackson because we were Radcliffe Fellows together almost 10 years ago. So it's nice to meet again yeah. at Radcliffe. <laughs> Uh, Major Jackson is the author of four collections of poetry. The most recent one is Roll Deep from 2015. He's the winner of the Cave Canham Poetry Prize and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry. He's published his poems and essays in many different venues, including the American Poetry Review, the Boston Review, the New Yorker, Poetry, Tin House, and other literary publications. He's also won a very large number of important fellowships, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Pushcart Prize, a Whiting Writers Award, and also he's been honored by a Pew Fellowship in the Arts and the Witter Biner Foundation in conjunction with the Library of Congress. Um, he, he lives in uh, Vermont, in South Burlington, where he is the Richard A. Dennis University Distinguished Professor at the University of Vermont, he serves as the poetry editor of the Harvard Review, and he has also done writer-in-resident stints at University of Massachusetts in Lowell and at Baruch College. So I'm really delighted to welcome Major Jackson, uh, and I hope that you'll join me right now in welcoming him. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, late afternoon. Um, this is somewhat of a homecoming of sorts. Um, it's such a pleasure to be back on the yard, the Radcliffe yard. Um, and it's also daunting because I'm reading poems, and I know some of you have heard these before. So I'm going to read some new poems as well. And, and I want to thank Julie and uh, Radcliffe and Sean and Becky uh, for getting me here. As you can hear, I'm also lacking some uh, vocal cords from late night coughing, but um, I'll speak up loud and, um, and hopefully uh, gravitate towards this thing of, of urban renewal. When, when Sean asked for a title, I should have just said poetry reading. Um, <laughs> now I have to frame my reading around this theme and I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how close I'll get to that. Um, well, I'm going to start off with a, with a new poem that's not in any collection. It appeared um, in the Virginia Quarterly Review. Um, it's called The Flaneur Tends a Well-Like Summer Cocktail. Curbside on an arp-like table, he's alone, of course, in the arts district, as it were, legs folded, swaying a foot so that his body seems to summon some deep immensity from all that surrounds. Dust shadows inching near a late 30-ish couple, debating the post-galactic abyss of sex with strangers. Tourists ambling by only to disappear into the street's gloomy mouth. A young Italian woman bending to retrieve a dropped Metro card its black magnetic strip facing up. A lone speckled brown pigeon breaking from a flock of rock doves, then landing near a crushed fast food wrapper newly tossed by a bike messenger. The man chortling after a sip of flaxen-colored beer, 
remembering that in the gospel of John, the body and glory converge linked to incarnation. And so perhaps we manifest each other. A tiny shower of sparks erupting from the knife sharpener's truck who daily leans a blade into stone. A cloudscape reflected in the rear windshield of a halted taxi where inside a trans woman applies auburn lipstick. The warlike insignia on the lapel jacket of a white gloved doorman who, opening a glass door, gets a whiff of a dowager's thick perfume and recalls bailing Timothy Hay as a boy in Albania. The woman distractedly watching a mother debate Robert Cole Scott's lurid appropriations of modernist art over Niswa salad suddenly frees her left breast from its cup where awaits the blossoming mouth of an infant wildly reaching for a galaxy of milk behind her dark areola. The sharp coughs of a student carrying a yoga mat the day's last light edging high rises on the west side, so they seem rimmed by fire just when the man says, and yet amidst the wages we pay, boarding the great carousel of flesh. It happens. Thank you. So um, what I was saying was, uh, to some extent, I think the work of the poet has been to kind of tease out among the great morass of details of our lives, uh, very simply to notice and observe. And um, I think that, you know, as when I first started writing uh, poetry, it was very much centered about around my... Um, around my experiences growing up in Philadelphia. And so um, maybe much to my chagrin, but it definitely set up this challenge of me writing about the city. And I instantly was tagged this urban poet, um, which felt confining in a lot of ways, and maybe even more confining when um, one critic compared me to Langston Hughes. He died 40 years ago. <laughs> like, anyway, um, here is uh, the very first Urban Renewal. I guess I gave Sean that title because um, uh, Urban Renewal is a series of poems that appeared in um, my first book and second book, not in my third, but in my fourth book. And I very much um, have been somewhat, um, I find myself growing inside this poem that is actually growing. Um, my concerns are um, not the concerns of when I first started in graduate school 20 years ago, um, but um, there seems to be the consistency of form that allows this to be a kind of stone that I, I chip away at. Um, when I fart, when I've my, in my first book, there are 12 urban renewals, and over the past 20 years, there's, I'm up to almost 50. Um, my aim when I first started writing it was to write a whole book. This was going to be my first kind of uh, first book, The Ambitions of Youth. It was going to be 120 urban renewals, 200. It's going to be tome. It was going to be this kind of build this Roman coming of age about my life. Yeah. <laughs> um, it requires great discipline. Here's the very first one. Night Museum. By lamplight, my steady hand brushes a canvas. Faint arcs of swallows flapping over rooftops swiftly fly into view. An irradiant backdrop of veined lilac dwindling to a dazzling cerise evokes that lost summer dusk. I watched a mother straddle a stoop of brushes, combs, a jar of royal crown. She was fingering rose dark as alleys on a young girl's head, cocked to one side like a Modigliani. 
I pledge my life right then to braiding her lines to mine, to anointing streets I love with all my mind's wit. The boy in me, perched on the curb of this page, calls back between blue sky popsicle licks that festive night the whole block set out on rooftops and doorways on the hoods of cars. A speaker blared Stevie above Bullock's corner store, a washed in fluorescence, as the buoyant shouts of children sugared a wall of hide and seek. Because some patron, fearing she stumbled into the wrong part of town, will likely clutch her purse and quicken pace, I funnel all the light spreading across that young girl's lustrous head with hopes we lift our downturned eyes, stroll more leisurely, pour over these sights. You are almost invisible in all this plain decay, children's laughter echoing in arcs of hydrant water spray knots the heart. Those black bathers like Cezanne's could soon petrify to silence. A chorus of power lines hums a melancholic hymn. Tenements, aching pyrrhics, doorways, and row homes crumbling to gutted relics. This one exposing a nude staircase, that one a second floor ceiling, where swings a light bulb like your chipped soul suspended from a thread of nerves. You have never imagined a paradise, nor made a country of your ghetto only suffered the casket of vessel for the human shadow, feared, longing for other stones to worship. The sun dreams the crowns of trees behind skyscrapers. Here, the heart is its own light. A pigeon's gurgle sings the earth. The eyes of the dead float around us. Mural Polaroids, street corner billboards, whose slogans read, aching humans, prosperous gardens. With um, both hoops and um, roll deep, I open up with a, a long, somewhat long poem, not really long poem, but a um, medium-sized poem. And that has a narrative. And this particular narrative, and I should say that um, a lot of the poems that are kind of story-based poems, there's a lot of embellishment, and then there's always something that I'm kind of, that's at the core of the experience that I'm trying to get at. Um, but this is definitely based on true story. Um, not all of it is true, though. It's about that two weeks I worked at McDonald's. Selling out, off from a double at McDonald's. No autumnal pinata, no dying leaves crumbling to bits of colored paper on the sidewalks only yesterday, just each breath bursting to explosive fog in a dead end alley near Fifth, where on my knees, my fingers laced on my head in a square barrel prodding a temple. I thought of me in the afterlife. Moments ago, Chris Wilder and I jogged down Gerard, lost in the promise of two girls who winked past pitch lanes of burgers and square chips of fish at us, raining over grills and vats. Moments ago, a barrage of beepers and timers smeared the lengths of our chests. A swarm of hard-hatted day workers coated in white dust Mothers on relief, the minimum wage poor from the fast food joints lining Broad Street inched us closer in a check cashing line towards the window of our dreams. All of us anxious to enact the power of our riches. Me in the afterlife. What did it matter? Chris and I still in our polyester uniforms caked with day old batter setting out for an evening of passion marks. We wore gazelles, matching sheepskins, the Yushanka, mouths from Leningrad. Chris said, let's cop some blow. Despite my schoolboy jitters, a loose spread of dealer's preserved corners, then a kid, large for the chrome huffy he peddled, 
said he had the white stuff and led us to an alley fronted by an iron gate on a gentrified street edging northern liberties. I turned to tell Chris how the night air dissolved like soil, how jangling keys made my neck, my neck itch, how maybe this wasn't so good an idea when the cold opening of gun barrel still poked my head and Chris's eyes widened like two water spills before he bound away to a future of headphones and release parties. Me, the afterlife. Had I ever welcomed back the old neighborhood? My a longing persistent as the seed corn maggot tunneled through me. All I know, a single dog barked his own vapor. An emptiness echoed through blasted shells of row homes rising above, and I heard deliverance in the bare branches fingering a series of power lines in silhouette to the moon's hushed excursion across the battered fields of our lives, that endless night of ricocheting fear and shame. No one survives, no one unclasps his few strands of gold chains or hums amazing grace or pours all his measly bills and coins into the trembling free hand of his brother and survives. No one is forced face down and waits 40 minutes to rise and begin again his march past the ice-crusted dirt without friendship, who barely knew why the cry of the earth set him running, even from the seasoned string of lights flashing its pathetic shot at cheer to arrive here where the page is blank. An afterlife. <clears throat> so many of those um, poems in the first book really do. I really can't see you. So uh, there you are. Um, they they very much had to do with um, some of the what I felt as though was a um, kind of uh, I say billboard, but. I guess what I, what I want to say is that I felt like my poems, which dealt with my youth, was writing against some of what I felt was um, some of the kind of cliché narratives around black men and black bodies. And what I wanted my poems to do is give texture to that, to create some sort, at least in my poems, a kind of um, an, an interiority that we can think about when we come across nightly news or when we come across um, movies that uh, tout and glorify a certain image and a certain lifestyle. Um, so that's what occupied me. And then, of course, you grow up, you read books, you get all literary, and then that passion starts to kind of turn in other directions. Um, but what, I, what I'll say is that I'm still haunted by some of the real life stories of people that I uh, grew up with and inspired. So Roll Deep was uh, kind of a way for me to return to some of the poems that I had written and put aside or to um, write um, new poems. Um, and there was also part of the reason why I also uh, put those poems aside is because many of my um, friends uh, who write and are um, very conscious about race work as it relates to artwork, often will get into conversations around um, uh, representing, how poems represent it, which felt at that time, um, now that I think about it, felt like the pressure that the early poets of the Harlem Renaissance had to uh, face when they went to write about folk culture or write, a, or write as Langston Hughes did, write poems based on a blues um, aesthetic. And a lot of it, what we're talking about to some extent is, um, is um, the politics of, of both art and race, but also thinking about um, uh, not wanting to focus too much for fear that people turn some of the narratives into emblematic narratives of all, of all uh, black people. So there's a certain kind of like politics that I didn't want to engage in 
by writing these. So that was one of the challenges, I want to say, um, what we call respectability politics. I'll, I'll use that phrase that was popular there for a minute. Um, yeah, so my friends would talk about other poets performing blackness or how the dominant culture sees blackness. Um, and so I put those poems aside. Even though they're there, even though they're based on real people, I decided I did not want to engage in that. But here is a poem. I'm happy I pushed that, <laughs> leapt over that hurdle. Um, here is a poem called Mighty Pawns, which is based on a group of, the, at least the portrait is based on um, some young men that I grew up with in Philadelphia who played chess, but to encounter them on the street, you wouldn't think, most of you would not think they had the capacity uh, to engage in such a difficult art. And yet they were grandmaster chess players um, who lived in this very poor neighborhood in Philadelphia, and they traveled, they traveled the world. And uh, I don't know where any of them are today, but they had a great math teacher who taught them. He's named in here. Um, and Hollywood made a movie about them. If you're interested in looking it up, they were, they were called um, the Bad Bishops. That was the name of the team. But um, the movie is called Mighty Pawns, if you want to look at it. It's a bad 80s film, <laughs> B-rated, but has some historical valence. Mighty Pawns. If I told you, Earl, the toughest kid on my block in North Philadelphia could beat any man or woman in 10 moves playing white, or that he traveled to Yugoslavia to frustrate the bearded masters at the Belgrade Chess Association you think I was given to hyperbole. And if at dinner time I took you into the faint light of his Section 8 home reeking of onions, liver, and gravy, his six little brothers fighting on a broken love seat for room in front of a cracked flat screen, one whose diaper sags, it's a wonder it hasn't fallen to his ankles. The walls behind doors exposing sheet rock, the perfect O of a handle, and the slats of stairs missing where baby boy gets stuck trying to ascend to a dominion far into you and me with its loud timbales and drums blasting down, blasting down from the closed room of his cousin whose mother stands on a corner on the other side of town, all times of day and night, except when her relief check arrives at the beginning of the month, you get a better picture of Earl's ferocity after class on the board in Mr. Sherman's class, but not necessarily when he stands near you at a downtown bus stop in a jacket a size too small, hunching his shoulders around his ears as you imagine the checkered squares of his poverty and anger and praise he does not return his precise gaze too long in your direction for fear he blames you and proceeds to take your queen. So that poem is um, what I realized when I wrote it was I in the process of attempting to dignify lives that in the public imagination did not have a certain kind of richness, I felt like um, I realized some of what I was doing was creating uh, portraits of people that I grew up with. And, um, and all the attendant kind of challenges uh, that arise from that. Um, some of the, remember I said not everything that I write is true? <laughs> Just remember that. <laughs> Blunt. The first time I got high, I stood in a circle of boys at 23rd and Ridge, tucked inside a doorway that smelled of urine. It was March, the cold rains all but blurred our sight as we feigned sophistication passing a bullet-shaped bottle of malt. Johnny Cash had a love for transcendental numbers and explained between puffs resembling little gas of air, the link to all creation was the mathematician. Malik, the smartest of the crew, counter-argued 
and cited the holy life of prayer as a gateway to the Islamic faith that was for all intents the true path for the righteous black man. No one disputed. Malik cocked his head, pinched the joint, and pulled so hard we imagined his lips crazy glued into stiff O's. It was long agreed that Lefty would inherit his father's used car business, thus destined for a life of wrecks. Then, amid a fit of coughing, I broke the silence. I want to be a poet. It was nearing dinner time. Jesus lived here. His sister was yelling at their siblings over the evening news and game shows. The stench of hot dogs and sauerkraut drifted down the dank hallway. A pre-spring wind flapped the plastic covering of a junk man's shopping cart. Zeddy Hardrick licked left to right the thin strip of glue at the edge of a rolling paper, then uttered, so you want the tongue of God? I bent double in the blade of smoke and looked up for help. It was too late. We were tragically hip. <laughs> So, you know, you grow up, you have adult experiences, and you write about that, hopefully. Um, or you move to Vermont. <laughs> and you go, oh, I didn't think I was a nature poet. But this landscape is doing something to me. Um, this is um, a poem that um, is more associative. I, I realized so much of my style was changing over the years when I unburdened myself of trying to write a certain kind of way and, and experiment. And, um, and I guess for me, I, there's so much of, of writing poetry that I enjoy. I enjoy, um, I, en I enjoy collaging images. I enjoy making sounds. I enjoy attempting, at least, to create some sort of authentic uh, utterance that strikes your ear, even though it may not, um, may not on the surface, offer up in a way of literal cognitive meaning. My hope is that the words are felt in the body. So that was, that was um, a kind of very deliberate uh, choice of mine. Some of my friends thought I was going for the anarchist effect, <laughs> the toss meaning out the window altogether, but that's not true. Enchanters of Addison County, which is just south of, uh, south of uh, where I live in Burlington and Chittenden County, Addison County. They say all of Vermont, there's more cows than people but uh, definitely in Addison County, that, that is true. Enchanters of Addison County, we were more than gestural, close listening, the scent of manure riding its waft on the leaves off Route 22A. By nightfall, our gaze flecked like loon cries, but no one was up for turnips nor other roots, not least of which the clergy. Romanticism has its detractors, which is why we lined the road with tea-lit luminaries and fresh-cut lemons. We called it making magic, then stormed the corners and porches of general stores, kissing whenever cars idled at four-way stop signs or sought grade A maple syrup in tin containers with painted scenes of horse-drawn farmers plowing through snow. The silhouetted, rusted farm equipment gave us the laid-back heaven we so often wished, and fireflies bequeathed earth stars, such blink and blank and bunk-a-bunk-bunk. -a -bunk -bunk. And of course we wondered if we existed, and also, too, the cows in the ancient pastures and the white milk inside our heads, like church spires and ice cream cones, even after all that cha-cha-cha. We still came out of swimming holes, shivering our hearts out. There's an ode to Mount Philo. I won't read that. Um, there's two graduate students today talk to me about a poem. 
that I've written that's published online as part of the Urban Renewal series. It's called, um, it's, it's Urban Renewal number 28, subtitled uh, Vermont. I want to read this um, and dedicate it to them because I, I, I often don't read this poem, but they have some great uh, insight. Um, I have a rhododendron bush just outside my office window where I write and a very heavy winter just turned. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but the, the leaves will wilt into these tight brown curls. And, um, and <clears throat> for many years that, that bush was doing fine and then I kept waiting for either those leaves to drop and new blooms come up and nothing happened. Um, so I'm sitting there and I, I think I start um, associating very quickly that image of those wilt, wilted um, leaves. And as we talked about in class, I think so much of the artist's imagination is about um, almost doing a very swift, uh, some would say time travel, but really is what Bly calls leaps. These leaps of images came to me in this poem was an attempt to uh, capture that moment. Number 28, Vermont. Outside my window, a brutal winter burn has curled rhododendron leaves to clusters of tight brown wilts, tobacco colored, they hang where white lilacs and pink azaleas blush to spring's myth of resurrection. A maple sapling sprouts erect amidst a snarling tangle of bare branches as I wait for the droops to uncoil. Why this hopefulness? Soft tinted postcards of sagging corpses lynched by mobs and elks arched Richard Springfield, Waco, Texas, mix and crossfade my sight in broad daylight like scenes from America's PowerPoint show of perversity. At Duke, an undergrad tweets an obscene noose to friends seen by millions to come and hang out with us. Spooked while driving in Virginia, a friend once swore the roadside litter in oaks and pines flapping white plastic bags were coded messages marking a new race war. Whiteness is never having to question the history of trees. When I searched this morning how to revive a dying rhododendron, YouTube recommends the speeches of Reverend Louis Farrakhan, Holiday's Black Body Swinging. So, more of a Vermont poem. My son um, plays soccer and, and lacrosse, and he's okay. He's pretty good, but it means you got to go to games. <laughs> and on this one particular autumn day, I was really enjoying um, the change of seasons. I thought by, this is also from the Urban Renewal series, but it's not in any of the books. I thought by now my reverence would have waned, matured to the temperate silence of the bookish, or revealed how blasé I've grown with age, but the unrestrained joy I feel when a black skein of geese voyages like a drop string from God, slowly shifting and soaring, when the decayed apples of an orchard amass beneath its trees like Eve's first party, when driving in the road Vanna whites its crops of corn whose stalks will soon give way to a harvester's blade and turn the land to a man's unruly face, makes me believe I'll never soothe the pagan in me, nor exhibit the propriety of the polite. After a few whiskeys, I'm loud this time of year, unseemly as a chevron of honking. I'm fire in the leaves, obstreperous as a drunk New England farmer. 
I see fear in the eyes of his children. They walk home from school and evening falls like an advancing trickle of bats, the sky pungent as bounty and chimney smoke. I read the scowl beneath the smiles of parents at my son's soccer game, their agitation, which is the figure the yellow leaves make of a quaking aspen. Okay. Just a few more. Thank you for being here. Did I do that already? Every poet does that. Thank you for coming. Um, this is my children's inheritance. A fancy for high green hills by a sea. Baggy spaces in the day. A knack for gunpowder thinking. A library humming like a swarm of gnats. The intrigue of a woman with a pitch perfect mind. Blinking eyes whose silence is ancient and naked. A grave that is not a grave, but a ruin to visit in middle age. I laughed at that when I wrote that. I was like, my children, they're not going to visit my grave like when I die. It's like later when they're going through their own crises. They're, like, <laughs> they're going to come to the grave, but it'll be ruined. A grave that is not a grave, but a ruin to visit in middle age. A shift robe of half-empty cologne bottles in various colors and dried flowers more dignified in death. Both evidence that I once cherished bouquets and timelessness. Bullet casings, a bowl of seashells, fine pins, one the Aurora Diamante with its two-toned rhodium plating that glitters when my right hand rages towards heaven. A love of big plates of pasta, Argentinian folk music, African rainforest and the speeches of Lincoln that miss the pages of my books more than my doorways. A habit for dancing when beats drop like existential stones. A disregard for the enemies of linnets and macaws. Fears that match the hawk-haunted buttes out west. A hard desire for justice. The habit of lip-biting when trouble nears. The way my mouth opens like a flower. My quiver of arrows that outweighs the world. Leaving the animals to bear witness. Memories of laughter that was bread and water, stylish hats, ways to time travel, the consequences of mistakes and second thoughts gummed to the future, a collection of radios, stacks of vinyl, the limitations of secrets, long nights that cascaded like waterfalls, my madness, granular and complex, sealed like a footfall. My son and me, at the bar in Otto's near Fifth Avenue, both off from work, the heavy foot traffic of silhouetted commuters hastening home outside, and us here, two drinks in. The conversation has just ramped up, and he wants to know why I did it. How could I have betrayed our family? The bartender is, in night school, we learn, for law, but meanwhile, he can name all the great vineyards in Sonoma, and how many laborers worked the field, and how many the crush pad last planting season, which incidentally, he said, gave us some of the best varietals he's told in years. But it's all really just a racket, though, like anything else in life, he says. I want to tell my son about the great poems I've taught that day, I've taught today, yet careful to avoid the sad lives of the poets. But he has long been exhausted of lines I recited to him since a child, my eyes carrying the exuberance of art, and so would only agitate and call up his condemnation of my friends as phonies parading their pseudo-intelligence. Instead, I reach for his hand across the varnished oak top. 
I was dying, I say, living a country of lies, to which he shakes his head. I swirl my glass, looking down avidly, churning the air so as to deliver oxygen and open up the wine, wishing to release its veiled bouquet. I'm going to end uh, with um, two poems. This is called You Reader. And it's, um, it was fun writing this poem because, again, I, I often uh, go for a particular sound. You Reader. So often I dream of the secrets of satellites, and so often I want the moose to step from the shadows and reveal his transgressions. And so often I come to her body as though she were lookout mountain. But give me a farmer's market to park my martyred mass, and I will name all the dirt roads that dead end at the cubist sculpture called My Infinity. For I no longer light bonfires in the city of adulterers and no longer smudge the cheeks of debutantes hurriedly floating across the, across the high fruit of night. And yes, I know there is only one notable death in any small town, and that is the pig farmer. But listen, at all times, the proud rivers mourn my absence, especially when, like a full moon, you, reader, hidden behind a spray of night-blooming Sirius, drift in and out of scattered clouds above lighthouses, producing their artificial calm, just to sweep a chalk of light over distant waters. <clears throat> and my last poem is called uh, On Disappearing. <laughs> On Disappearing. I have not disappeared. The boulevard is full of my steps. The sky is full of my thinking. An archbishop prays for my soul. Even then, he was busy waving at a congregation. The ticking clocks in Vermont sway back and forth as though sweeping up my eyes and my tattoos and my metaphors. And what comes up are the great paragraphs of dust, which also carry motes of my existence. I have not disappeared. My wife quivers inside a kiss. My pulse was given to her many times in many countries. The chunks of bread we dip in olive oil is communion with our ancestors who also have not disappeared. Their delicate songs I wear on my eyelids. Their smiles have given me freedom which is a crater I keep falling in. When I bite into the two halves of an orange whose cross section resembles my lungs, a delta of juices bursts down my chin and like magic makes me appear to those who think I've disappeared. It's too bad war makes people disappear like chess pieces and that prisons turn prisoners into movie endings. When I fade into the mountains on a forest trail, I still have not disappeared. Even though its green facade turns my arms and legs into branches of oak, it is then I belong to a southerly wind, which by now you have mistaken as me nodding back and forth like a Hasid in prayer or mother who has just lost her son to gunfire in Detroit. I have not disappeared. In my children, I see my bulging face pressing further into the mysteries. In a library in Tucson, on a plain above Buenos Aires, on a field where nearby burns a controlled fire, I'm held by a professor, a general, and a photographer. One burns a finely wrapped cigar, then sniffs the scented pages of my books, scouring for the bitter smell of control. I hold him in my mind like a chalice. I have not disappeared. I swish the amber hue of lager on my tongue and ponder the drilling rigs in the Gulf of Alaska and all the oil painted plovers. When we talk about limits, we disappear. 
In Jasper, Texas, you can disappear on a strip of gravel. I am a life in sacred language. Termites toil over a grave, and my mind is a ravine of yesterdays. At a glance from across the room, I wear a September on my face, which is eternal and does not disappear. Even if you close your eyes once and for all, simultaneously, like two coffins. Thank you. <laughs> now I can make a tea. Um, OK, so I'll get us started uh, with a few questions. And then we'll let you ask questions. So I won't uh, take up too much time. So um, thank you very much for that reading. It was wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask, so Urban Renewal um, is a series of poems, but it, it uh, extends across mo three of your four books of poetry. And then you also referred to one that was published online. And you also read us some poems that were clearly, that were set in Vermont, mm -hmm. that were part of the Urban Renewal series. So um, several questions come to mind. One is, uh, when did you realize you were writing a series? And um, uh, how do you feel about the fact that your series is sort of dispersed mm. and not kind of collected and presented right. as such? Yeah. Well, I, that youthful dream of, that uh, tome of a book is still um, deep inside me. I still want them to come together. My hope is that, that I'll write enough of them that, uh, that even the ones that are dispersed will find a home all together. Um, what, what I wanted to read were the poems of travel that also are um, written in this particular form, um, poems that take place in... Uh, in Italy, and uh, Kenya, uh, Greece, Spain, uh, Jamaica. And what I'm realizing is that it's not so much a poem of place as it is me trying to um, inhabit different landscapes and grow inside this particular form. Um, if, you, if you look at it on the page, they're all kind of single blocks of text. Um, uh, and there's a there's a formalism that either you hear or you don't hear, and um, the, the, there's alternating rhymes and internal rhyme and these kind of long, lush sentences that accrete, um, uh, hopefully, empower through images. Or so I I have I have been consistent in that regard. It's just that the lens has widened to include my life, not just in Philadelphia. So. This poem is growing along, along with me. Yeah. And the term renewal, urban renewal? Yeah, even back then, um, I read just a little bit about Richard Nixon's um, urban policy uh, to rebuild cities post the riots, um, post 1960s, 1970s, um, and knew even, even then when I first started that I wanted to appropriate that term because so much of what I wanted to get at is that my, my young life was enriched by um, the presence of art in my life and people. And so the renewal was not, was it, it's supposed to signify on that social policy, but it's more if you like look at the poems and some of the themes that come through, many of them kind of narrate my encounters with uh, people in my neighborhood or uh, works of art, music. Uh, the musician um, Sun Ra lived to, uh, two or three blocks away from me in Germantown. Um, I visited, I've, I've said this in other views, but I grew up in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, so urban renewal was, again, to get at certain narratives that you wouldn't know if you relied on <laughs> popular culture or the evening news. Yeah, that makes sense. I, um, I also wanted to, men to uh, ask you about the flaneur. 
Ah, you yes. mentioned it. Yeah. Um, this famous concept introduced in the 19th century by Charles Baudelaire, the poet, um, and the flaneur is a stroller, uh, an urban stroller, probably a bourgeois subject with a lot of time on his hands, and probably a he. And, um, uh, you know, it's a kind of a way of taking in the scene, but also kind of being a master of it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, Yours was alone in an arts district, sitting at a table and drinking beer. And so I just, I mean, I just would like to ask how you think that, that persona of the flaneur that's so kind of charged for us. Yes, it is. Um, uh, yeah. How it works in your, in your poetry. Well, you're, you're absolutely right to talk about um, or allude to class and privilege. But again, I think one of the... Um, what I, what I take away from that figure is the imperative to enter into what is being, what is being seen. And, it, and what I was trying to say earlier, I think, um, I think writers, I won't say poets, although we're the superior, for, you know, everyone knows <laughs> we're superior at this than anyone else. Uh, but poets, um, particularly I think the best of us, um, you know, going back to um, uh, Russian formalism, they defamiliarize what is seen around us. And I think um, part of what I've long been trying to do is kind of tease out um, what strikes me as not, not terribly remarkable um, on the surface, but to kind of delve a little bit further. And I really do think um, it's what we often say is, is, is contextualization. And so the guy who's you know, delivering a package in New York City where that poem took place actually, um, um, who's eating at the same time he's navigating traffic and tosses his wrapper, you know, that's a detail that could quickly go by. But if you think about um, that bird, you know, like the series of, of, of images that came to me. Sometimes, and I, I wonder if there's writers in a room that feel this way, it could be overwhelming, the kind of flood. And so there's, there's some part of, of the flaneur that it's almost compulsory, I think. Um, the strolling part, however. You can sit I wish I could and do have more a beer, that. right, yeah. and still consider yourself a flaneur. Yeah. Um, it's more of an emblematic figure than an actual uh, theoretical figure for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So I'll ask one more question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, uh, uh, what do you think? What do? What for you personally is the connection between the urban and poetry specifically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> I almost wrote an answer down. I was like, um, How could I not? You know, I, I recently have been uh, acquainting my, my youngest son with the Harlem Renaissance, and I was thinking about the migration of, of African Americans who brought with them to the North um, a whole kind of you know, a set of values, but also a culture. And, and how wonderful that particular moment was um, captured in, in, in the literature specifically. Um, I think as a, during that particular period, I, I'm thinking about how a life gets recorded and almost archived. And so I see the poet as kind of archiving uh, rich experiences in our lives, just to kind of go back, go back to that a little bit. Also, um, uh, if I think about poetry, I was saying this to some students today, I can hear, believe it or not, I can hear 1920s um, in the poetry of Eliot. I can, I can hear the rhythm of that particular age. And um, I think 
finding the rhythmic equivalents in language to a particular age such that it enters our body. Um, I th particularly in urban spaces when so much of it is, you know, my house in Vermont is totally, you know, I'm very chill. But I get here and it's like, you know, hop in a taxi, you know, like go get to where you're going, jump out, someone's rushing in, get your coffee, someone's in line behind you, someone's in front of you, you know, it's just, so I think the art helps to kind of slow us down in a way. Mm -hmm. um, while it's recording, I think while the poet is recording, uh, there's something about the pacing of a poem that forces you to acclimate to its rhythms. And uh, that's, that's, that holds true too for, um, for rural areas as well. Um, I think part of, if you listen to country music and blues, bluegrass, you can hear the kind of languidness of time that exists in rural spaces, you know. So I think, um, I think poems record on many different levels. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm sure that some of you have questions that you'd like to ask Major Jackson, and um, maybe I'll just let, I'll let you recognize uh, mm -hmm. people who have their hands up. Um, be sure to maybe stand up and ask your question with some volume. Yes? Oh, my name is Arturo Reynoso, and I am fascinated by two things that happened tonight. I had a conversation with uh, someone from India, and my thing is that so I have this sense that my spiritual home is in India, even though I'm not from there, I've never been to India or anything mm -hmm. like that. But you have mentioned twice Argentina. <laughs> uh, flying over Buenos Aires, my friend is from Argentina, and I was thinking about her. <laughs> and flying over uh, Buenos Aires, and uh, folkloric music from Argentina as yes. part of your uh, legacy. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? <laughs> What's up with me in Argentina? <laughs> I have this belief that if you put the energy in poems, it'll happen. So I'm trying to get there. Uh, uh, let's talk. <laughs> uh, well. South American culture, I mean, whether it's Peruvian culture, I'm really fascinated, interested in the, in the presence of, of, in the lasting cultural legacy of Africa there. And so um, if I do go there, it would probably be more research. But I love the culture, and I love the food. And um, uh, a friend of mine, I was very jealous of a friend of mine who got to spend about three, three or four years there. Um, and there's a very vibrant art scene uh, as well. So I think I'm, I, it's, it's in the music. I, was, I mentioned the folk music particularly has been really important to me. Um, I don't listen to too much music when I write, but when I do, that's among the music that's in rotation. Uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, with that. I'm interested in your relationship to the political. Um, specifically, how do political pressures from your communities and also internal pressures um, that you place upon your, yourself affect your relationship with a blank page? Meaning how, how, it seems like you have this very sort of distilled, defined um, relationship with your lens. Could you expound on that? Yeah. Um, when I was speaking earlier about respectability politics, I think that at some point became a kind of um, a lock on my imagination. And it became very important. That was the only pressure that I, let me just say, that I felt because my mentors were, um, it very literally, um, both black and white, people who came from progressive communities. Um, there's a, in my life, there was a, um, a Jesuit priest who uh, worked with Dan Berrigan and his brother. Um, there were um, activists from the 60s and 70s, uh, teachers, writers, 
um, who were mentors. And so I inherited this continuum, I would say, of consciousness around um, art that was functional, art that made a difference, art that protested. And then at some point, and I don't know, I can't figure out when necessarily, um, there's a certain um, demand that you have for your art to be art, to elevate to the realm of art and not, and not sloganary. However, that's not me at all announcing myself as apolitical. Um, and in fact, I firmly believe it's a mark of an artist or writer's maturation when they realize that their writing uh, should be beholden and responsible to us as a larger, as a larger community of human beings who are trying to navigate shifts in regimes, <laughs> political regimes, and and decency. And I want to add to that particular decency. The thing is, I want it to be on my own terms. I don't want it to be programmatic, and I want it to be artful. So I think. Um, there's been some tremendous, wonderful poems that have been written that uh, protest conditions here in America. And my great uh, regret is that we do not celebrate and teach that tradition uh, in this country. Um, and it's not, just, it's not just protest poems or Vietnam War poems. There are poems that are far more quiet than that but have great political valence and resonance. Um, that should be an award that we give, much like the Poetry Foundation gives an award to, the, I think it's the uh, Mark Twain Award for, the, for humorous poetry. I think we need to come up with an award that uh, announces uh, uh, the political dimensions of our, of our work. Anyway, um, it, how does it impact my, my relationship to the page and my art? I think it's a wonderful challenge. I think it's... Uh, it forces me to, I said it was a chain or a lock on my imagination, but um, I like the challenge of writing something that will uh, hopefully have an impact um, and that furthers the cause of, of, of social political justice. Sometimes I only, there's, there's been several poems of mine that someone has brought up to me and said, hey, you know, this one guy was like, oh, your poem, How to Listen. I, 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 I go, oh, you're a poet. He goes, no, no, but I really like it. I open this group meeting that I have for men that batter their wives with your poem, How to Listen. Oh my God. Right? And I'm like, if you told me to write a poem about a group of guys who I probably would have frozen up. But who, knew, who knows how poems exist and find their readers in the world and, and, and how people are going to take it in uh, and, and hold it close and use it and pass it on. That's, that's a mystery to me. But I think it's just enough to uh, play close attention to language, the demands of form, the desire to make a new sound. Those are all noble. Hello. Thank you. Um, how long had you lived in Vermont before you found Vermont-based imagery creeping into your poetry? And yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit about. Yeah, I resisted it mm -hmm. for a while. I resisted writing about ice, ice fishing. <laughs> uh, uh, there's moose signs everywhere. Um, I haven't seen one yet. I've read about them. Uh, I, it's been, I, it took me about, um, close to 12 years to finally decide that, OK, I'm going to like write about this place. You know, It's startling beautiful. I mean, I drove cross country to uh, Oregon to go to graduate school, and I camped along the way with a, with a girlfriend who um, wasn't so keen on camping. So we had to go into these motels and hotels occasionally. But I really, uh, what happened for me was this very deep appreciation for uh, landscapes and varieties of landscapes and really how stunningly beautiful this country is. 
Um, but when I got to the Cascade Mountains and Northwest and hit the coast, the Pacific coast, my something inside me just broke. And so I realized that I was gravitating uh, towards landscapes of this particular sort. Everyone will tell you there's about, um, African Americans make up less than 0.1% of Vermont. And we joke that we all know each other. And someone leaves half the, even temporarily, half the population <laughs> decreases. Um, uh, fortunately for me, though, I travel quite a bit. I still have family up and down the East Coast. Um, so I never really felt firmly in Vermont because I was traveling so much. But um, a couple years ago, I decided that it's going to be home. We'll be home for a while. I might as well contribute. There was a great number of writers who have come through there. Um, Ashbery and um, Ron Padges, is a great poet who's, who's come through there. Uh, and Vermont has, is, has no shortage of, of writers and poets, a great tradition of writing. So I'm reading a lot of Grace Paley now, who wrote about Thetford, uh, Vermont. I mean, she, everyone knows she wrote about New York, but she lived in Thetford, Galway Canal, wonderful. Tradition. Yeah. Microphone. Here it yes. comes. Uh, hi. Hi. I was getting sort of in a, a dreamy state listening to your uh, color that you're bringing into your poetry, uh, particularly des descriptive aspects. Yeah which becomes uh, almost painterly in, as, in some aspect. <clears throat> but I wonder, um, maybe in connection to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, how you escaped the really decimating aspect of urban renewal in Philadelphia <coughs> during the 60s and 70s, which largely attributed to the destruction of the inner city. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the whites moved out into suburban mm -hmm. areas. And that was not uncommon in American cities. And it left uh, a certain income, which was you know, the middle class white income, which sus somewhat sustained the city from completely breaking down into pockets of uh, real, really extreme poverty, uh, which didn't have any money, mm -hmm. unless it was supported by, say, an a anti-poverty program, which was actually sort of a way of keeping you in poverty. So can you contrast that to moving to Vermont, which is sort of in an antithesis hmm. and to that kind of environment hmm. and maybe draw on it from your poetry from the standpoint of uh, your museum experience as a, as hmm. a kid. Mm -hmm. Well, I would never use the word escape. Um, I, people have used that word in the past, and and I understand from the outside what it looks like. Um, I was going to use some visuals tonight, uh, just so to, to get at that contrast that you're talking about. Um, but I will say this: um, it was such a rich experience in that growing up where I grew up. Um, the people around me um, had great dimensions. Um, evenings were full of, of fun and music and play. And then crack cocaine came. And that was the bomb. Um, that had people compromise long-held values that were, um, that sustained them for a long time in their, in, in their communities. Um, I had 
like a, a lot of people who, you know, if you read Richard Rodriguez <laughs> and others, there's, there's someone who mentored you or took, took a special interest in you. Someone who said, apply here, you know. I was, Sister uh, Nancy pushed a summer um, math camp at, uh, not Exeter, what's the other one? Andover. Andover. My mom was like, no. <laughs> I don't know no Andover, <laughs> right? It was people like that. And I wouldn't say escape as much as I was fortunate. My, my therapist asked the same question. <laughs> How'd you escape? <laughs> like, no, I was, I was quite fortunate. And, um, and I had interest that, that kind of made me stand out a little bit. Um, books. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. That's wrong. Uh, I had friends who read. And there was a group of us, group of kids. Um, you're, 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 to some extent, you're right to ask that question. I very much appreciate it. One of the things that I'm taking up now as a project is the amount of rural poverty in New England. And I want, to, I want to do a photo exhibit and write poems. I want to take the photos and write poems. I think the label that, and this is part of the reason why I started writing, I wanted to dignify the lives of people that we kind of write off in urban areas because they're poor. And the, one of the things that this election showed us is that those we have to challenge those language. We have to challenge those particular terms because the level of poverty in rural environments outstrips <laughs> outstrips um, some of what we are accustomed to seeing on the screen. Um, it's profound to find yourself, you know, in certain certain places. Like, whoa. And then you really realize that the narrative here isn't about race or who's a racist. It really boils down to who has it and who doesn't have it. Very simply that. Um, I've traveled quite a bit over the years, and I've seen that dynamic uh, in Kenya. I've seen it in parts of Paris, who has it, who doesn't have it. Uh, there are certain parts of Paris that look like where I grew up, right around the corner. The crazy thing is, a, a young lady that I recently met, it's like she teaches art at Temple University. It's like, oh, where do you live? It's like 26 in Thompson. I was like, you would have been robbed. You would have like, what are you doing? The area is so gentrified now. I couldn't. Be, I haven't been to my own neighborhood in many years, but you know, the the the. What you're talking about, white flight and um, social, policy, social policies definitely had an impact. But I, I, I think Tally's Corner or any other study you want to point to, they don't, give the, they don't give the rich narrative that I feel like poems and, and stories can give us. Hey, y'all. Thank you for coming. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's, no, one, there's more one, more, one more question. One more? One more. I was just going to ask, since Sorry. you brought up Tally's Corner, there's this like, great Ralph Ellison quote about him not seeing Harlem in the sociology that he was reading about it. And as a sort of urban sociologist, I'm curious if you can sort of impart any advice on how to sort of describe in ways that feel authentic urban places beyond the form of poetry. Yeah. So, so the repeat that last part again. So, what's the core of the question? How to, how to describe and sort of you want to call authentic or rich, right. um, Sort of urban places yeah. beyond yeah, the yeah, form yeah. of poetry. That's where I feel like, you know, I I often push my students away from uh, cliche thinking and to kind of cultivate a restlessness with with words, um, and that's where I feel like figuration starts to create great nuance and maybe gets to a greater precision. Um, I wrote an essay about the fact that, um, about the fact that white people don't, talk about, don't write about race in this country. Now, now we do because some things have happened, but, but at that time, 
the poems that I looked at, for example, the, the popular term for white poets writing about race was always big and black. You can often, it's, it's amazing, I couldn't believe it. Every time I opened a poem, I was like, why do we have to put those two words together? Are there no black dwarves? No one that you're not like afraid of? That's not scary, right? But that's the inherited, the inherited uh, language. Or the young men who you know, wear clothes that's not tight-fitting. Also, um, how do you describe that in a way that isn't about your fear? Or you, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I think finding the language really has to come from some genuine space that is, um, that is generous and um, that is humane. I think, I think, I hate to say it, but I think journalists are very lazy and they help to contribute, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a small reception, yes, okay. just outside the room. So if you want to speak directly with Major Jackson, then that's where you can do it for a little while, yeah. if he holds up. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing thank good. You, thank you very, very much. Thank you.